This congregation was gathered in November of 1881. There have been some 7,290 Sundays since then. Assuming that they took some of them off for snow, we don't do that anymore, and some of them off for holidays, we don't really do that anymore, this congregation is open. As long as there's not a pandemic and the air is not poison, this building is open. It was really hard during the pandemic to not be able to come here and see each other face to face. We pivoted pretty quickly to meet online. Remember that? It was, oh, never forget that Sunday, March 15th. We went, whoop. We cannot meet together here. And David and Jim and I and Justice met in the room here and we didn't know how poison the air was and stayed so far apart from each other and we'd been broadcasting, streaming some assemblies and maybe two Sundays we broadcast from this space and then we said, can't do it anymore and we began broadcasting from home. And um, Justice and then Jacob and others helped us keep assembly happening but it was really hard not to see each other face to face. How many Sundays were we only online? Do you know how many I, months? I, I don't know. It was months. It was over, well over a year. Yeah. Was it maybe about 18 months? Let's say 18 yeah, months. Exactly. But this congregation gathered in 1881 was not stopped by the pandemic. And here we are back again, finding our way again, finding our strength again, finding our place both in the building and online, taking a snapshot and understanding what the new normal is. So it's good to take a snapshot, to take a pulse, to do so as we emerge from the pandemic and continue to live into the endemic implications as a community. So how and why and why now? What, what is it that we're doing? You may know that I have begun my doctoral studies at United Theological Seminary of the Twin Cities. I am moving toward a Doctor of Ministry degree I'm in the inaugural cohort of the Learning Center for Social Justice, which is funded by a grant from the Lilly Endowment. 20 scholars from a variety of religious settings meet for nine months to explore, discern, create, question assumptions, and propose new models for justice. Be assured that I will not complete a D-min in nine months. It's a much longer process, but this is the first part of it for me. As a part of this program, we were invited to work with Convergence, an organization that supports the reshaping of organizations, congregations, and leaders driven by the values of an inclusive, progressive theological vision for a more just world for all. Convergence works primarily with pro progressive Christian congregations and leaders. So engaging with us at First Unitarian Society has helped broaden their knowledge and understanding of what congregational life can look like from a humanist perspective. In the fall of 2022, past fall, we invited members and friends of FUS to complete an online survey. Some 89 members and friends of FUS did so. This was exactly the target number of folks that we needed, representing about 75% of our Sunday morning attendance at the time. Our attendance has increased since then, counting both, both in-person and online folks. You answered demographic questions, how you feel about FUS now, 
in comparison to pre-pandemic times and what your hopes are for the future. In addition, I filled out a leader survey to share some information about our program offerings, staff particulars, and financial health and the like. Convergence took a look at our outward facing communications, our website, social media, and educated themselves about humanism and Unitarian Universalism. They used local demographic information to share about our neighborhood to place us in context in our city. This report has been shared with our Board of Trustees and the Research Director of Convergence will be joining the upcoming board meeting this week for a brief report. Were the costs not covered by the Learning Center for Social Justice by this Lilly endowment, such an assessment would have cost FUS around $2,700. It was not a, not a small thing, and we probably would not have reached out to do this assessment, but you can see how, it would be, how it's worthwhile to a congregation. Sorry, y'all, I'm just dry this morning. So what did we learn? Well, some things that we already know. We are mostly older, but we do have many families with young children. We have single parents. We have singles. We have couples. We are more diverse than the average mainline Protestant congr congregation in terms of sexual orientation and less diverse in terms of race. We're highly educated, and we are mixed in terms of income. Survey respondents ranged from newcomers, one year or less, to long timers, more than 10 years. It was a good, broad sample. There's a slide of our map where we come from. We come from all around the metro region. Almost half of respondents live over five miles away. Almost 20% live over 10 miles away. Many got stuck in the tunnel, right? That's why we got stuck in the tunnel this morning. It's no wonder that Sunday is our big day and why it's hard to gather an in-person crowd for midweek programming. It's almost impossible to get here in the middle of the week without get, for an evening program without getting on a freeway, right? And we're so glad that we have the online option. We understand this congregation now as both in person and online. You may be watching us from either down the street or across the country, and we think that's great. Our reach over time and space has to do with our historical identity as a humanist congregation. Of all 10 of the Unitarian Universalist congregations in the Twin Cities metro area, the large and the small ones, we are the most identity-based. In fact, we think we're the largest humanist congregation in the country. There's an old hymn that used to be sung at UU ordinations. Rank by rank, again we stand. It reminds us somewhat arrogantly of the ministers who came before, of lives that speak and deeds that beckon. Today, it also makes me think of the congregants, those early humanists who gathered and dreamed of such a congregation as this. What they dreamed be ours to do, hope their hopes and seal them true. There's a word cloud that we have. Have you seen a word cloud before? This is the one at the bottom of page eight, Jacob. A word cloud is a, a computer program. In answer to a question, you enter words into a program and the frequency of repeated words comes up in this 
word cloud. This image is an answer to the question, what keeps you involved in this congregation? The biggest theme here is certainly our people and the community we share, followed by the values and the beliefs that we espouse. Is it, is it visible? Can you pick out the words? The bigger the word, the more often it was repeated in the answer. So the smaller words may have been mentioned once or twice. But the bigger ones, community, these, the bottom one is the one I'm looking at. The top one is, how did you happen to come to FUS? I looked. <laughs> I looked for it. I looked for a Unitarian congregation. I had a friend or a family member who told me about it. There's good data in here about how people find us. Those can go down now, Jacob. Thank you. I need to pull my computer up just one moment to come here. Here are some of the things that you said about your perceptions about the congregation, that we have a clear mission and purpose. I'll say to you that some of the language they used is a little more um, traditionally theological than we might, but you went with it. That this congregation is spiritually vital and alive is working for social justice, holds strong beliefs and values, supports vibrant ministries through the financial time and investments of ministers, has worship that makes me think, is easily accessible through public transportation. Some of the things you think we need to work on are to increase our membership, to reach more out into the community, to increase our diversity, to welcome younger members, especially younger families. And some of the re recommendations that Convergence has for us is to work on our website, make us easier to find, make it easier to understand how to get here and that we don't have a parking lot and you gotta figure out how to park on the street make it easier to understand uh, how to join us, not just online, but in person. Make it easier to get involved in some activities. And I expect that the board and the staff will be looking at some of these things. And when we come up with initiatives, we'll be asking you to be involved. Visitors consistently say that they get a warm welcome at FUS. And newcomers often report that they get a warm welcome and then it sort of drops off. They don't always know how to get involved. People sometimes report that FUS feels like a family. And that feels really good unless you can't break into the family. Right? A family can feel a little cliquish and it's hard to break in. So it's We've got some ways that we can grow with this. There are some, um, Jacob, I'll invite you to bring up the map of our neighborhood. They did a demographic study of the mile and a half around our neighborhood. And as you can see, a big quadrant of it is the downtown core, right, which has some residential in there, but not a great deal. But the rest of it, three quarters, is mostly residential. What we know from that is that there, it has much more ethnic diversity than our congregation. It does not have people who are deeply committed in their own faith communities. The faith commitments of these demographics in, in the surrounding neighborhoods, like the rest of the country, has dropped in the last 15 years. So 
If we were to do outreach in our neighborhood, both for people to be in, engaged in our community, but also to serve our neighborhood, we would not, sometimes I think we are, think we're gonna be fighting people of another faith. We are very unique, you know, we're very unique. And that we'd be fighting people of another faith. We don't want to be those church people, right? They're not concerned about that so much. And we've got a message that we want to share. We've got a message that is both secular, but we organize like congregation. We have the best of both worlds. And we have a message both that can bring people in, but also serve the community. And I think that's something that we have to share, that we can work on. Um, our, our embrace of progressive values of LGBTQ+, plus, of equity and inclusion, those are things that we can build on that we already have in this congregation. And that demographic in those neighborhoods is younger than the demographic in this congregation. And that's an important thing for us to, to grow on. You can take that down, Jacob. There's so much in this report. I'm eager to uh, continue to work with it, to work with this uh, program that I'm in and, and create a proposal that will come out of it. We'll see where that goes. I'll be working with David and staff and board and so on. What I think feels really important is what do we dream what is the congregation that we dream? Those people in 1881 were starting something and they had no idea that 141 years later, we'd be here on this snowy morning. I can promise you they didn't. It's hard to imagine that far ahead, that we'd have phones in our pockets no way. Golly. <laughs> what might we dream? What is the world made whole that we could dream and live into as a humanist, as the largest humanist congregation in this country, the beacon of humanism? with work to do on our own for sure. It's an exciting place to be, and here we are together to do it. What we dream be ours to do, hope our hopes and seal them true. May it be so.